It's good to see the Frankie Evans because, of course, they were our sort of musical leaders in so many ways. And for those of you who went around in the old days at Albert Park, well, we decided we wanted to have happenings. And, of course, the council came along. You know what bloody councils are like. And said, no, you're not allowed to have happenings in Albert Park unless you get a permit. And we said, well, we don't know what to bloody apply for. I mean, the whole point of a happening is no one knows what's going to happen. And they said, we don't care what you apply for. So long as you apply, we're going to give you the permit. You've just got to come down to the council meeting and make an application. So um, John Shannon, I think, turned up in a pink pair of long John underpants and he read out a poem to the council. And I went round and gave every councillor a packet of jelly beans as my submission. Well, Sir Keith Park, he just bloody um, scoffed his packet of jelly beans. He had been through the Battle of Britain. He didn't care. He demanded another packet. But Sir Dove Meyer Robinson was the mayor, and he was a slightly more complex character. I mean, he was about five foot two, he was um, really left wing, but he was a multi-billionaire, and he rode motorbikes at Western Springs, and he was a nudist. And he held this, <laughs> he held this packet of jelly beans up and decided it was a direct attack on his character, so he called the bloody cops down from Cook Street, and they arrested me for distributing jelly beans in a public place. <laughs> They actually got me under the Grocers Act of 1892 for distribu <laughs> distributing food in pu public without a permit. So, of course, I told the judge he was a neo-Nazi fascist from hell and I'd never pay the fine. And he brought his little bloody gavel down and I got 30 days in Mount Eden. Well, that shut me up, I can tell you. <laughs> And of course, if you ever end up in Her Majesty's free boarding house, let me give you a few clues, all right? I was really lucky because George Wilder was in the cell next door to me, so he gave me a few clues on survival. And I was only in the pound because half of you buggers marched down the motorway and they had to spend a whole lot of money putting a fence up and I got the bloody blame. So I was in the pound and he said, the first lesson you learn, Tim, is you never look at anyone, all right? Otherwise, it's, what are you looking at? Nothing. Don't call me nothing whack, you know. So you, your life can turn to custard real quick. So I was, a, I was a cleaner in the kitchen, and I just moved this yard broom back and forth and didn't look at anyone. I was just staring at the bloody wall. And, um, and, 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 and suddenly it blew. They had this new social engineering. They decided that all police cadets in New Zealand should be locked in a cell for two hours and then should have to eat a typical prison lunch. Well, of course, we, the, the temperature went up in the kitchen. I thought, Jesus, it was like being in here today. We were cooking. Let me tell you, you think it's hot in here. You should be in Mount Eden's bloody kitchen sometime. It was boiling. And I thought, oh, shit, it's going to blow. It's going to blow. I hope I don't get hurt. I hope I don't get hurt. And they were closing down the mental hospitals as well. And there was this guy called Smithy who should never have been in jail. And just as it was out about to blow, he leapt up on the kitchen sink and dropped his trowel and did a crap in the stew. <laughs> well, of course, the superintendent took one sniff of the bloody, you know, and of course, we didn't know what to bloody do. The whole kitchen was smelling, so the head chef turned around to me and said, Shadbolt, go to the storeroom and get the bloody curry powder. So I ran, ran down to the storeroom, and he came back with a big packet of curry and poured it into the stew. Well, of course, when they served it up to the police cadets, the superintendent took one sniff of the stew and he said, I told you, he said, it's war in here, it's war, it's them and us, and them, it's them and us, they've deliberately put curry in the stew so that we can't eat it. He said, gentlemen, I want you to eat it and enjoy it. <laughs> and uh, so there's all these police cadets eating the bloody stew. Well, of course, in about the superintendent realised something was gone wrong in there, so he grabbed the nearest drug, he whacked him over the head a few times and said, what's happening in the kitchen? And he said, oh, don't tell anyone I told you, but Smithy did a shit in the stew. And he raised it and said, don't eat the stew, anyone. But it was too late. <laughs> And because I was the cleaner, I was up till three in the morning cleaning up all the vomit. But anyway, I'm only, 
Roger said I could speak as long as I wanted to, so long as it didn't last more than five minutes. <laughs> and um, so I've got a copy of Bullshit and Jelly Beans here if anyone wants to look up some old photos. I brought it on trade me and I got bloody swindled. It, was, it said it was a hardcover copy and I bid it up to 100 US to buy it. And when it bloody arrived in the post, it was just an ordinary soft-covered bloody copy and they had it glued their own hard cover on the outside of it. So even my bloody own book, I got swindled for it. Now, these guys are just about ready to go. I, just, I was never a singer or a musician, but I love poetry and I'd like to just read one. One old poem to an old bloke, because we did lots of things beside dancing in Albert Park, and one of them was tenancy disputes and protecting people, and there was an old guy in Freeman's Bay called Jack Watson, and they were going to smash his home down the build the new motorway and on ramps to the Harbour Bridge. And of course in those days when they took your home off you for a motorway, they'd only give you market valuation. They wanted to give him 8000 for his home in Freeman's Bay and they were all selling for about 20000 So he said, no, stuff you, I'm not moving. He stayed in his sleeping bag in his hut, he bloody buried his turds out in the garden and the neighbours brought him bottles of water and he lived in his house with no sewage or electricity for seven years and the old bugger won. So it was one of the few victories. <laughs> we didn't win many fights. So I wrote a poem to him. This is to Jack Watson. Helen of Troy wasn't built in a day and neither was Freeman's Bay but they smashed it down for half a crown and built a motorway. Now Jack was born in the house he owns, t'was built by his grandfather and now they say both he and the Bay have got in the way of council flats and a motorway and he'll end up in fire and damnation if he doesn't accept government's valuation of his life. Freeholder, you ask for a home for a home? It's against the law, of course, but we'll accommodate you if you'll excuse the pun and sign the hardship clause. But Bob Alcindor across the road, you gave him 23 grand. But yes, they said, but Jack, he was a JP and you're just a working man. For three long years, a prisoner of war in Rome and Germany, and now he's a prisoner once again in the chains of bureaucracy. Yes, Jack, you fought for freedom, but it can't have been your own, for you cannot swap your war scars for a humble debt-free home. Thanks very much, everyone. Good to see you all again.